Good afternoon. In the Madeleine Corbell Albright Institute's 15th anniversary year, we are so proud to celebrate our 600 alum fellows who span the globe. Now, if you weren't a fellow yourself, you might be asking, what is the fellow experience? What is it we do here? Guided by Secretary Madeleine Albright's collaborative leadership style and dedication to public service, as well as the mission and values of Wellesley College, the Albright Institute draws linkages between education and practice for our fellows, our aspiring global leaders. We exemplify and advocate for the value of diverse and multidisciplinary perspectives when addressing global challenges. And of course, for many at the Institute, Secretary Albright was a light and an inspiration. We do our very best to keep her legacy alive by pushing our students to be empathetic and curious, just as she was, and to hold complexity amidst challenging global problems, just as she did. This is a partial response to what we do here. And I'd like to deepen this response by quoting Diana Chapman Walsh, President Emeritus of Wellesley College, under whose leadership the Albright Institute was founded and began to flourish. In her introduction to Maddie Talks in its first iteration in 2016, she posed the question, what is it we do here when boiled down to its essence? We learn and we love. We open our minds and we open our hearts. We share our stories, face our fears, nourish our hopes. We question ourselves. We question each other. And in that questioning, we discover how little any one of us alone can know, as much as we may study, as hard as we may try. We notice how easily we can fool ourselves, how complacent we can become. And so, over time, we come to experience how much we depend on each other. When we can all find the courage to bring our most honest, authentic selves, our biggest dreams, to this rich learning community into which Wellesley is evolving. Then we begin to live into answers where we had only questions before. These 12 alumni fellows, ranging years and disciplines, have begun to live into answers where they had only questions before. In today's Maddie Talks, we will have the opportunity to hear their stories. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Maddie Talks 2024. Hi. So in honor of Maddie and in the spirit of connection, we're going to do a little chant. And in her famous words, I'm going to say hell yes, and you're going to say? What's next? That's right. Hell yes! What's next? Hell yes! What's next? So what is next? Ooh. So what is next? The world is becoming more interconnected. And what happens in one side of the world is becoming more and more relevant to what's happening here today in our own lives. And when I think about what's next, I'm thinking that connection is next. That's what Maddie was thinking was next. But not just interdisciplinary connection, which is what we've talked a lot about today. It's also the connection that you make with your own dots, the dots within you. The more connected you get with your own life and your own mission, the more we can connect to each other's missions and to the global why. And so we can not only find larger opportunities through the alignment of those two things, but also solve problems in a more sustainable way. And when I think about connection, I think about this very room. This is the Barnes Foundation. In this room, I, I became weak to the knees because I realized, as someone who's fueled by connection, that what connection is, is, is a, it's a how. It is how are we constantly connecting with the world around us and with ourselves, this circular connection. And what Dr. Barnes did in his collection that was so unique, he was an American inventor, is that as, his, as he would go through life experiences and collect new art and new objects, he would 
create clusters and ensembles. He called it learning by doing. And he would reposition that art in relation to itself to take on new meaning and to understand something from a different place, from a new frame of mind. And it reminded me of a particular project I did during the Albright Fellowship years. You know, when we, when we try to solve big problems, sometimes it's the small problems that count. And for me, what was small or really large was figuring out as a first generation American what the definition of love means to me. And so what I did was I was traveling across six continents and as I would travel studying public health systems and trying to understand how to borrow and fix, I also was looking how to borrow and fix the challenge that I was trying to solve. And so I created the love book. And everywhere I would go, I would collect definitions of love. And Madeleine Albright herself was one of those entries. And the learning lesson, or the learning lesson for today, was for me that each one was unique, but each one I encountered turned something new on for me that I hadn't known before. Had I relied on my own definition, it would have been limited. And all these definitions together brought this limitedness, li limitless idea and vision into picture for me of what I could be. This is my family just a generation ago. My family um, are Iranian. And look at me today. I've come a long way. It's a huge leap. And that's exactly what connection does. It helps us navigate the unknown. And it helps us get from A to B, of course. But sometimes we don't even expect those connections, right? It's that serendipitous connection that just suddenly makes you feel lucky, that can change the needle. Or it can be those connections that you work so hard on, and it feels like you've just won Tetris, right? But for me, again, in my life, my vision of love didn't exist in the current community that I was living in. And so my challenge after college was, how do I build the life that I want to live? And for me, in the end, a Maddie talk for another time, I ended up meeting my Wellesley wife of my dreams. And in two months, I'll have a baby with my wife, Gabriella. <laughs> But looking back, I wouldn't have known. And it was a series of that energy that I brought to connection, that believing that connection was the solution that helped me get to the end goal. Four years later, a couple of years later, or four years ago during COVID, when we were all pushed into our boxes, I wanted to push back out. Because as you know already, in the few minutes that you've known me, I don't like boxes. And so I pushed back out. At the time, I was experiencing that the New York City was experiencing a lot of limitations in terms of financing. And priorities were being shifted. And so I went on a Wellesley panel just like this one. And I met my now CEO and also Wellesley alum. And she opened my eyes to this idea of sustainable finance and how do we build communities and build systems at scale that are inclusive, that can profit, and reinvest those profits back into the community. And so she revealed to me a, a big challenge that was right under my nose, despite having an immigrant background, uh, a, ch a challenge that needed a solution, and that was an immigrant crisis right in our country, and not the one at the wall that we all get inundated by the media with. This one was that 9 million of us, 9 million immigrants here today, are eligible for citizenship and many of them do not move forward. Actually, all of them, or only 10% of them every year, move forward. And the majority of the reason why is that despite their motivation, it's expensive. It's complicated. It's expensive. You start from scratch when you're an immigrant. That's part of the immigrant journey, right? You come here. You have to learn a new financial system. You have to learn, oftentimes, a new language. And so all of this compounds. And the average immigrant takes about eight years to naturalize. Think of what you've done in eight years' time. I know what I've done. I've gotten a BA. I got a master's. I had four jobs. I found my wife. So in all that time, it's, it's taken they, so many of them do not have citizenship. And it's all because of both the complexity and expense. So how do you reduce that barrier? And the expense itself, while it's $725, you know, less than an iPhone, it's about really the navigation of complex systems that makes that 725 so hard. 
right? Or for a family of four, it compounds. And so we set off to answer this question. Initially it was, we're gonna create a 1% interest loan. 1% interest sounds like a really good deal, right? Um, what was unique about it is when we looked around across the country, we noticed that a lot of people were being providing grants, they were providing loans, but those loans were at a higher interest. And so what we did is we wanted to create something that it can achieve scale, right, and sustainability, to really eliminate the barrier for all nine million, not just for a portion of that. And if you were to depend on grants, that would cost nine billion dollars, money we didn't really have to mobilize right away. And so what did we do? Something that Maddie talks about, or Secretary Albright has talked about a lot, is she says, I think my greatest talent is dot connection, which is one thing leading to another. There has to be a way of trying to figure out how things go together. Nothing was off the table. We took all the resources that we had and brought them together, starting with defying the idea that uh, that media portrays about immigrants. And what we did is we rolled up our sleeves from the ground up, thousands of immigrants, we heard their stories, they informed the insights that helped us design the program and help us figure out how to best deploy the solution. And so when I think about getting to a self-sustainable solution that's scalable, I think about my story and how I never thought I would ever work in the immigration space. I was always a seeker of problems and figuring out solutions, but it's interesting that internal struggle that I went through, starting from scratch and building from the ground up, I thought I would build this business thinking more in business terms and not so much in personal terms, and what revealed itself is that connection is key across the board in terms of how we figured out our financing, how we mobilized people to reduce the barriers, how we maintain coalitions with partnerships to figure out how to make this solution known. It was all about connection and figuring out how to best connect, how to connect faster. That's what not only um, created the access, but also reduced the cost for millions. And so that brings me to my final point, is that when we think, when we get closer to our own dots, when we get closer to what our mission is, we get closer to what our we mission is, what everyone's mission is. And when you align those two things, you can for sure create sustainable systems and solutions that are both inclusive and agile for the world that is ahead of us. And to not forget that there is all, not the touchy-feely type of connection alone, there's how we think about connection moving forward, and you'll hear from my peers today, the ways that they turned things around and looked at them from a different lens, lenses that they never expected to think of, and how much that brought to the project that they were working on, that connection itself is the innovation, not just the innovation itself. And there's so much more in this room to squeeze in terms of connection. Thank you so much for having me. This is my home. For many of us, coming back to Wellesley feels like coming home. I grew up here, and Wellesley has a very special place in my heart. The Caribbean is also my home. I spent most of my early life in Montego Bay, Jamaica, within 15 minutes of the sea. My parents met at the beach. And perhaps that explains the special place the Caribbean coastline has in my heart. The sea calms and rejuvenates me. Despite my forever love of the sea, I've always had a very tenuous relationship with it. In my adult life, I approached it like a, an inquisitive child, approaching a somewhat threat. Curiosity would pull me close to the waves, but wisdom would keep me from exploring its depths. This all changed when I joined the legal team at the Nature Conservancy. You may ask, what does the practice of law have to do with the sea? Well, a few months after I inherited the, legal, the Caribbean legal portfolio at the Nature Conservancy, my supervisor asked if I wanted to become certified as a diver. 
I paused and then told him we had to overcome one little hurdle. You see, a girl who had grown up within minutes of the sea could not swim. <laughs> we had a very good laugh about it, and then I left with a new resolve. A resolve to overcome my fear, and a resolve to gain all of the knowledge and skills necessary to truly support my teams. Despite having grown up in the Caribbean, I'd never thought about what it meant to preserve our natural resources, or what I like to call the garden. This is a metaphor that's born from my faith, and from many of the places that I've been able to call home. New Mexico, Wellesley, Jamaica. The reality is that the garden is under threat. A threat that faces not only the Caribbean, but all of us. While the statistics and the predictions may often feel very daunting, I've witnessed teams in the field, joining hands with local communities to tackle the challenges that are threatening their lives and their livelihoods. It has really been the embodiment of thinking globally while acting locally. And that was a principle that was reinforced during my time at the Albright Institute. Every day, there are teams across the globe that are engaged in community-based approaches to conservation. This year, I had the opportunity to join them on tracks, trucks, trails, boats, buses, and bikes. Many of my curious relatives asked if I'd abandoned the practice of law in favor of conservation. A lot of my friends said I was having way too much fun for it still to be considered work. I must admit, it has been an absolutely exhilarating adventure. Today, I would like to share with you some of my orientation into conservation, and some of the images that I've captured along the way. My journey started out at the Nature Conservancy's preserve at Estate Little Princess in St. Croix in the United States Virgin Islands. There, we have a newly opened coral lab. At the coral lab, I learned a little bit about, well, I learned a lot about the techniques that are used in coral reef restoration. For the first time, I truly absorbed the fact that coral are living things. And one of my favorite techniques at the lab was the use of snails to clean the tanks. I will report that I am an unofficially certified snail hunter. <laughs> Never mind the fact that I didn't actually catch any snails, or that I'm still not sure which snails we were looking for. They all look the same to me, which makes the work of my colleagues even more impressive. We have teams in Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Cuba, and Grenada that are doing similar work in coral reef restoration. And these teams, like many across the globe, have had a very difficult year due to widespread coral bleaching events resulting from this year's higher temperatures. Can I tell you a secret? In Grenada, they actually let me help. <laughs> Our team there works with community members to harvest, microfragment, and outplant corals. What this means is that local fisher folk go out and they capture corals of opportunity. So those are the ones that may have broken off for different reason, whether storms or just friction. They then cut them into really small pieces and grow them in the lab. Once grown, they then replant them on the live reef. What this meant for me is that I was able to use a very sharp standing saw for the first time. I got to cut my baby coral and I even got to name it. Talking about babies, we also visited the mangrove nursery and there the team is working to replant mangroves along the coastline. And this is one effort to reducing wave erosion in these coastal areas. Our trip ended inland where we met a farmer that had benefited from a rainwater harvesting program. I became a little emotional as he explained that his ability to catch, store, and then distribute water that had come in the rainy season meant that his farm was able to survive the dry season. It was such a tangible reminder of the role that nature has in our lives and how dependent we are on nature for our very survival. One of my favorite experiences this year was visiting our program in Belize. In 2020, the Nature Conservancy purchased an 
in excess of 200,000 acres of forest land in the Belize Maya Forest. This land is now being managed by a local NGO for the benefit of the government and people of Belize. After a nearly three hour drive into the heart of the forest, I encountered some of the greenest vegetation, the bluest skies, and freshest air that I'd ever seen. On one of our bike rides through the forest, we almost met one of the native wildcats. The telltale sign was an extra pair of paw prints that were not there on our way out. <laughs> My team was disappointed, but I was quite, I was very relieved. <laughs> for, for these animals, the forest is home. And being there made me realize and appreciate all the work that our teams do to preserve this home for whether the vegetation or the animals for generations to come. I have watched my Caribbean colleagues invest in relationships to accomplish national conservation goals. They promote educational and professional development opportunities that allow citizens of all ages to get involved in the field of conservation and to participate in community efforts at conservation. That work, it really exemplifies the Albright Institute's multidisciplinary approach to global challenges. I am constantly in awe of the work that our development staff, our administrators, attorneys, and other leaders at the Conservancy do. They show up every day to create a world in which people and nature can thrive. At the end of the day, I will always be an island girl. There's music in my heart and there's sunshine in my soul. Food is life and flavor comes first. There's never a dull or completely quiet day in the islands. We're family, we share community. There's really no place like home. And my current work is dedica dedicated to preserving that home. Back to our garden. We're all gardeners. We each have a plot of land that we should tend well. Or, as a good Jamaican, let me leave you with a track and field metaphor. <laughs> we each have an opportunity to run our leg of this relay to preserve our lives on this planet. Whether your leg is in the Wellesley Scream Tunnel, the mountains, the valley, the desert, or the islands, may you be intentional about running your leg well. The baton is in your hands. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be back at Wellesley. I was roaming the quad this morning and just peeped into BV, my sophomore year dorm. It brought back a particular memory of that spring. I remember I was in my dorm room, sitting frozen, with my major declaration form on one side and my course selections on the other. I'm sure I wasn't the only one because with just a few hours remaining to submit those forms, I could hear loud, anxious chatter from the BB living room. Class syllabi from Milton, multivariable calculus, and the politics of Russia and Eurasia all stared back at me. I was overpowered, both by my indecisiveness and my ADHD. <laughs> this led to the decision to do all. <laughs> I was unsure of what I might need for my future, but I was driven by the curiosity to find a thread, a connection between them. And as I entered the Albright Institute, I did. The Albright Institute became the nexus where I found links between disparate disciplines and different perspectives. My group was the international group clubbed together because of the time zone proximity during the peak of the pandemic. We spanned five different countries, multiple ethnicities and cultures. Different upbringings, different majors, different voices. What could go wrong? <laughs> well, our opinions clashed. Each of us behind our patriotic shields, our various majors becoming our line of attack. However, 
the empathy of one of us shone through when she highlighted the perspective of the Inuit population, for whom the Northwest Passage, our subject of contention, was home. It was a perspective that could have been easily overlooked, and often is. They weren't mentioned in the economic journals we were poring over or the data I was trying to find and pushing for. That perspective, powered by compassion, defined our project going forward. And it was my first lesson in connection, bringing the human in with the scientific. The power of different perspectives, of different connections, went far beyond anything I'd ever known. In harnessing those different perspectives, it didn't just give us the ability to tackle the question in front of us, it also helped us connect with each other, helped us understand each other's motivation, and answer the why before the how. And that mindset became the foundation for my work in model development and decarbonization at MIT. My work there with my colleagues and mentors was focused on building an accurate machine learning model simulator. One that would optimize energy usage and predict consumption and loss under different decarbonization strategies. That's a lot of tech. So how was human connection the most important aspect here? Well, my journey started with analyzing an existing climate simulator in an MIT class my senior spring, En-ROADS. En-ROADS is a climate change simulator that allows you to explore the impact of dozens of policies, electrification, afforestation, nuclear tech, you name it, are on variables such as sea level rise, global temperature rise, and air quality. It's used widely by policymakers, educators, and students to learn and test cross-sector climate change solutions. In class, we had to answer this question through the simulation. What combination of climate change solutions from this model should we implement to keep global temperature rise at two degrees Celsius? My group and I explored these different parameters as we played with the sliders. We chose an increase in nuclear technology as our primary solution. A heavy investment, good returns, with limited need to implement any other mitigation strategies. Easy. But as I presented it to the class, lessons from my experience with my Albright group and my data ethics classes poured in. I realized that when the scientific heavily overpowers the humane, it isn't a solution. I challenged it, as I believed it was focused more on the science and much less on the human consequences of climate mitigation strategies. In our work, my team and I wanted our simulator to be that and more, to reach that level of technical sophistication. But more importantly, we wanted to deal to learn to deal, actually, with the hidden or overlooked aspects of big data. And our first step, having a one-hour Zoom call full of icebreakers to understand each other's backgrounds and personal motivations for engaging in this work. Let me lay the scene out for you. I was the primary data scientist of the team. My last physics class was in 10th grade, and I was trying to understand heat pump engineering. Yet, it was my connection with my mentors that gave me the courage to ask questions about things I didn't understand, and then to raise my voice about things I believed needed consideration. Data manipulation and communication became more than just statistical techniques. At every step, I questioned the type of data I was working with, why I decided to use a specific way to deal with missing data, and very importantly, how can I communicate my data effectively? Our goal was to connect leaders in this fight against climate change. Connect with data was our mission. My colleagues and I gave presentations to different departments and spoke to various leaders in the decarbonization field. And the question that guided my every interaction was, how can I use the data in front of me to build a connection with the person beyond those numbers, understand their motivations, goals, concerns, 
and find a common ground. How do I make this personal? Because as we all know, it very much is. I got a part of my answer when I emerged from my world of code and sat at the Cambridge City Hall to learn more about the Cambridge Bedo Green New Deal. The third and final piece of the deal was up for consideration. It was an amendment to the Building Energy Use Disclosure Ordinance, which required large buildings to reduce their em emissions to net zero by 2035 or to pay a compliance fee. A big deal and a two-hour discussion supplemented by 80 public comments followed. We heard from administrators and powerful decision makers at big institutions, as well as homeowners voicing their concerns. Instead of just trying to club these as the qualitative part of my project, something I often did before, I listened. I tried to empathize, to connect. I learned my second lesson that it wasn't enough to merge the human and the scientific. We needed one to inform the other. The qualitative must inform the quantitative. Data had become a language, but just like any other language we speak, we learn so much more when we listen. Witnessing all these voices get considered was my third and biggest lesson in developing responsible technology. I connected it back to something I learned in Professor Ennie's class, where we delved into the findings of the feminist geographer, Joni Seeger, in a class reading. <coughs> what gets counted counts, she asserted. Seeger, whose research focused on gender, environment, and policy, points out that in today's age, there is more global data collection on gender than ever before. Yet, she questions. Is this data representative if it forgets to count non-binary people and older women? Would it really lead to developing better policies? And I implore you to question, to challenge, is this the type of incomplete data we're using to build our prediction models, models such as En-ROADS that lead the way in climate change solutions or to define policies of the Northwest Passage? Are these older women, the non-binary folks, and the Inuit people also going to add to Mimi Onoaha's library of missing data sets? This list of data sets exists as an art installation where each folder is labeled with phrases such as people excluded from public housing because of criminal records, accurate birth registration data in Rwanda. And when you open these folders, they're empty because these people were never counted. So, what's the solution? Strengthening data infrastructure was my first thought, but no. The answer lies in connection. It's in connecting with people and understanding how they want to be counted, how we all would want to be counted. It's time for us to listen, to empathize, and to connect. It's time for us, as the Albright Institute emphasizes, to raise our voices to challenge existing technologies from their roots, to negotiate for humanity. Because, as a classmate once said, there's a human behind every data point, and every human must be counted. Thank you. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there to hear it, does it make any sound? I'd like to take you on a walk today through the forest of Netherlandish art history. It's a subject I've been studying since 2016 with a special focus on the Dutch 20th century painter Pike Koch. Now, I would be shocked if anyone in this room today had heard of Pike Koch before. Outside of the Netherlands, he is virtually unknown. But I assure you that within the forest of 20th century Dutch painting, he is quite a big tree. Pike Koch was born in 1901. He died in 1991. His paintings hang in major museums across the Netherlands and Belgium. The last painting of his to be sold at auction at Sotheby's in London in 2020 went for over 500,000 pounds. 
I remember when I first came across his work and I asked my professor what he thought of him, he said to me, Pai Koch, he was a fascist, he was a Nazi, he was wrong in the war. Nevertheless, he is one of the Netherlands' greatest painters. This seeming contradiction between good and bad, admired aesthetics and reviled morals lies at the core of not only my interest in Pai Kolk, but also why I believe he is so revered and yet still so unknown. Pai Kolk's politics are controversial in the Netherlands, its relationship to his art even more so. The predominant view continues to be that his politics had zero or only incidental influence on his art. My dissertation argues against this view. My research has convinced me that Pai Kolk aspired to be recognized as the Netherlands' greatest national socialist painter under the Third Reich. Once we accept this as a possibility, ideas relating to this aspiration pop up in his oeuvre from the 1920s through to the 1980s, and we begin to understand Pai Kolk more as a member of an international community of artists for whom fascism and national socialism form an indelible part of their artistry, from France's Louis Ferdinand Céline to America's own Ezra Pound. But Pike Kolk has not yet been recognized as a member of this community because so much of the context surrounding his paintings, in other words, our ability to hear the sound they are making, has been lost. Current museum trends which favor participatory and inclusive exhibition approaches over historic ones have deafened our ears to the context we need to understand many of these paintings. So let's visit one of these museums, the Koninklijk Museum for Schone Kunsten in Antwerp, a world-renowned collection which recently reopened in September 2022 after a 100 million euro renovation. It made headlines around the globe for the innovative way they reorganized their permanent collection, not according to history and geography, but according to themes. What does that mean? Well, right now we're looking in the horizons room. At the center, you see not an artwork, but a playground structure that children can play on and climb on as their parents gaze upon artwork spanning over five centuries and many different nations. The only thing they have in common is that they have a horizon. Pike Koch's painting, Het Uur U, in English, H Hour, hangs presiding over the playground to the far left in the back. So the room tells us that this painting has a horizon. The placard doesn't tell us much more besides the name, the name of the artist, and the date it was made, 1971. This is the third version of this painting Pai Kolk made, the first in 1958, the second in 1964. So let's look at the painting. We see two bodies lying on the ground in the foreground on what looks like a potholed golf course. In the background, we see a mountainscape, a sky at either dawn or dusk, and multicolored parachutes falling to the ground. If we were to look closer, we would see tanks, people, and bicycles attached to these parachutes. So let's say we want to exhaust the museum's resources. What can they tell us about this painting? We go to their website, we look at the object description. This is what we read. At home, the talk was mainly about the Cold War. My father was a cold warrior, very anti-Russian, according to Peter Kolk, the artist's son. So already we have a bit of a problem because the only source this object description cites is the artist's son, a diplomat and five-time ambassador who has his own political reputation to think about. Now, Ambassador Koch is a priceless source on the artist. However, is it appropriate for an object description on a museum website to use him as their exclusive source? Not in my opinion. Nevertheless, the object description continues, and based on this only source, they declare unequivocally that this painting shows a Russian attack. They then tell us that it's an unreal scene derived from Pike Kolk's anti-Russian sentiment and imagination. To me, this sounds less like information and more like noise distracting us from the authentic sound that Pike Kolk is trying to make. So let's try to figure this out on our own. Beginning with the title, H hour is a military term for hour of attack, like D-Day, the day of attack. When we think of D-Day, we think of World War II, June 6, 1944, the Allied invasion of Normandy, and the subsequent Allied operations to liberate Nazi-occupied territories. Pike Kolk never gave his painting superfluous titles, and the idea that he would have given this painting a military title without considering associations to World War II seems rather far-fetched to me. The parachutes he paints 
resemble images of Allied forces dropping into Nijmegen for Operation Market Garden, the Allied operation to liberate not the Netherlands from Nazi Germany. This operation was a failure for the Allies and a relative success for the 9th and 10th SS Panzer divisions. They also resemble in their multicolors descriptions from veterans of the multicolored parachutes resembling a large flower with insects crawling over it. The mountains give the painting a precise location. This is a 19th century well-circulated engraving of the village of Bake near Nijmegen and a stone's throw from the German border. In the background to the far left we see Mount Elton and to the right we see this peculiar double humped mountain ridge. Now in Pykoch's painting these are closer to the foreground and that's probably because his painting is in the valley, that is to say in the village of Bake as opposed to looking down upon it. Now, why would Pike Koch paint a village, a painting of Bake? Well, Pike Koch was born in Bake. He grew up there. He died longing to return there. And the Battle of Bake was an important part of Operation Market Garden. It was fought between the Americans and the Germans from September 18th to September 21st. The Americans incurred significant losses. They retreated. They came back. They destroyed the center of Bake. They failed to liberate it. It remained in German hands until February 1945. Now this painting is beginning to look much less like an unreal Russian invasion and much more like a very real American invasion. So the question remains, was Pike Kolk mourning an allied loss or was he commemorating an Axis victory? Well, the painting doesn't give us a clear answer, but Pike Kolk's words can point us in one direction. You know how pessimistic I always have been, he wrote in a private letter in 1980. As a matter of fact, since the annihilation of the only strong nation state on this continent in 1945. So with the exception of this last quote, all of the information I've used to interpret this painting is publicly available. So why did the museum not provide us with it? Is it not important? Is it not relevant? Last year, Geert Wilder's far-right Freedom Party won a majority of seats in Dutch Parliament in a landslide victory. As Americans were in 2016, many Dutch people were surprised by this result, but they shouldn't have been. The Freedom Party has been among the three largest parties in the Netherlands since 2010. So why were Americans surprised then and Dutch surprised now? Perhaps for the same reason, Visitors are walking through the Horizons Room in Antwerp, oblivious to the fact that a painting quite possibly commemorating a Nazi victory is presiding over their children's playground. Institutions which once committed themselves to educating and informing their public, to teaching them to listen for falling trees, have abandoned their posts in order to entertain, befriend, and appease. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there to hear it, does it make any sound? The answer should be obvious, yes. The question I'd like to leave you with today is, when will we and when will our institutions stop entertaining this question? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I've given variations on the theme of this talk many times in the past year to scientists, to members of the military, to policymakers and decision makers. And while the message is always the same, I have always had to keep the policy and the personal separate. And this talk is a little different because I get to combine the personal with the policy. So it's, it's really a treat and it's really precious for me to get to, to, get to talk about this today with all of you. So I fell into the world of diplomacy, security, and nuclear nonproliferation somewhat by accident. The story begins almost 10 years ago, the summer before my junior year at Wellesley, where I was majoring in astrophysics. That's a, a selfie of me with the Milky Way and some satellite that photobombed us. And over the summer, I was conducting an internship in the Netherlands with the European Space Agency and Leiden Observatory, and I made a discovery that changed my life. When I was there, I learned that a delegation of astronomers from a foreign country had just came and left right before I came, so I just missed them. 
but where were they from? I couldn't guess it. And my boss said, well, they were astronomers from the observatory of Pyongyang. And it had never occurred to me, despite being an astrophysics major, my whole life was astronomy, it had never occurred to me that there were astronomers in North Korea and that there were astronomers active with countries all over the world. So I became hooked on it. I started learning Korean. I started talking to scientists who had collaborated with North Koreans or who had worked on projects related to science in North Korea. And what I learned was that not only does North Korea have a robust and established scientific community, not just in astronomy, but in multiple fields, but what I learned really fascinated me. The Korean Peninsula has a thousand-year-old tradition in astronomy. Korean kings and queens were trained as astronomers first, and astronomical, astronomical data was considered something like classified intel back in the day. That would be a very important secret because astronomers were actually the first forecasters. We were the first to predict accurately the movement of celestial bodies. And that was what spilled out into our understanding of the weather, our understanding of mathematics, and our ability to ask things like, what is China or North Korea or Russia going to do next week? Those are hard questions and we can't quite answer them, but I think that astronomers have novel ways of approaching them. So one of the questions I had was, well, if there are these North Korean astronomers and scientists, why aren't we collaborating more with them? And the answer, there's a long version and a short version, and the short version was nuclear weapons. And that's essentially what it came down to. So what did I do next? Well, the summer was up, so I came back to Wellesley, and I applied to the Albright Institute because I knew, coming from science, that I was going to need to get some perspectives from international relations, from economics, from history. I didn't take classes in any of those subjects when I was here at Wellesley. So I came back to the Albright Institute, but I still wanted more. So after working for a few years, I went and started a master's where I could learn, transition from astrophysics into nuclear physics. So I wanted to learn everything about the nuclear weapon. So I trained to operate a research reactor in the Czech Republic. I went to Japan where I visited the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactor site. I was there. I had no personal protective equipment because it's safe now. I drank the local water. I ate the local food. There's a lot of stigma against people who've experienced radiation. So it was really valuable to go there and to see that with our own eyes. So unfortunately, one of the weird things I had to confront, I still have trouble putting into words. So I'm hoping that this image can kind of help evoke this kind of dichotomy in space where, as an astronomer, I, kind of, I come from the world on the right, but the world on the left is kind of the same thing. And so I was discovering that the astronomy that I always knew from one perspective was not only deeply enmeshed with nuclear physics, which kind of makes sense. I mean, astrophysics, nuclear physics, it's all physics in its core, but also that it was really important for international issues and this kind of sticky situation of dual use. Dual use is a policymaker's concept. It's not a scientist's concept. In science, there's not peaceful use and dual use, there's just use. And so I saw this construct, dual use, and I felt that it was getting in the way of scientists being able to cooperate with each other. And so that became one of the big challenges that I wanted to address. Because from my perspective, when I think from a nuclear perspective, the atom knows nothing of treaties or territories or trauma. It's the laws of physics and those laws alone that it obeys. So when I look at nuclear issues, with a nuclear eye or a scientist's eye, the solution is going to be scientific. So when you look at this photo of the Korean Peninsula, and I imagine some of you have seen this photo before, it was very famous when it first came out. I mean, what do you think? There were all kinds of things people speculated about electricity and development on the peninsula. They contrasted it with the South. But can you guess, as an astronomer, the first thing that I thought when I saw this photo? Wow, there is no light pollution. I just dream of what the Milky Way looks like from North Korea. They have the darkest skies on Earth, and we're forgetting what a precious resource that is that we are losing to light pollution. The thing is, when we have an adversary sitting across from us about whom we don't know very much, and maybe they're not compelled to take the first step, to take the first move, there is something that we can do. We can share what we have. And this is powerful for multiple reasons. 
I'm not suggesting anything big or sensitive. I'm not saying, here, take our latest hypersonic technology. I'm saying things like, let's look at where we have mutual interests. North Koreans, they care about their fisheries. They care about the nutrition of piglets. How do I know? Because I've read the scientific papers they publish on this. The work that they do on their science tells us about them. It tells us what they care about, what their priorities are, what their resources are, and what the limits are, considering we're working with a country so isolated like North Korea. There is a treasure trove of information to learn. But what's even better is when we, when we want to create an ally relationship, flip an adversary into an ally, what do we do? We share part of ourselves. Why? Because it illuminates both of us. If I share part of myself with North Korea and I know nothing else about it, the one thing I do know is North Korea has what I shared. And that's really powerful. Forecasting the future in unpredictable times requires tackling uncertainty with creativity and tenacity. In a world of accelerating technological advancements, coupled with proliferating fake news and increasing skepticism towards science and scientists, we urgently need to develop and implement scientifically informed diplomacy on regional and global scales. When I wonder what the future holds for strategic stability, for nuclear nonproliferation, there's one truth that I hold absolutely certain. There are still precious few scientists who are involved and who are doing this work, and we need everybody involved. I hope throughout my life to dedicate, if I'm so lucky, to dedicate my career to doing this work, to fostering peace building between adversaries and allies alike through science. I believe that there is a true astronomer in each and every one of us. We are made of star stuff. We are wired for wonder. And whether it's through training in the old ways of the Soviet cosmonauts in Moscow, or trying to fight for the inclusion of North Korean scientists in the global community, these are my astronomical aspirations. And what I want to know is, what are yours? Thank you. Hello, everyone. What an incredible honor to be here to talk about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, children, and particularly children in crisis, and how we might use design to reimagine early childhood as we know it. I thought it might be helpful to give you some context to where I'm coming into this work from and where I hope to go. I came to Wellesley um, in 2015. Um, as a first-generation international student and fell completely and madly in love with anthropology. Uh, the study, the fascinating study, uh, what people do and what people say and why they do and say as they do. Um, somewhere down the line, I graduated and wanted some sun in my body and went all the way westward to California. And at Stanford, I discovered another fascinating space, which was learning sciences, which was the study of how people learn. And in the combination of anthropology and learning sciences and design, um, I got intensely curious. Um, at Stanford, I led a study where I looked at 200 families across eight countries, trying to understand how games and play can be used to build some of the most foundational skills in children. So the presentation today, I've divided into two parts. The first, I want to give you some context into this world of early childhood development and why what happens in our childhood determines our life as adults. And then I want to ground some of this research in a real life case study um, around a phenomenal project that we ran in Sri Lanka. So what does the research tell us? In the developing world, one in every three children, one in every three children, will not reach their fullest developmental potential, both cognitive and social-emotional learning. It becomes worse when a child experiences what we call an adverse childhood experience. This includes things like childhood abuse, malnourishment, death of a family, even in the most recent times, COVID. And to give you some context, people who experience around three to four 
ACEs or adverse childhood experiences is four times more likely to experience depression as an adult, is 3.5 times more likely to experience kidney failure. So that is all to say what happens in your childhood matters. You might ask me, well, Kavi, there's so much time between when you're a child and when you're an adult to build these skills. Why are you so worried? Neuroscience tells us a different story. 90% of a human being's brain development is done and dusted by the age of five. That's scary, but that also means there is this incredible opportunity during the early years to build some of these foundational skills. So you might ask me, well, there's research, we know what to do, why is the data so bad? Well, we're not using the data. We use AI and data for everything from who we swipe right on to our Spotify playlist to our most optimal route to work, but we don't use it when it comes to making decisions during the most critical early years, which means a lot of the decisions we make as parents or parents-to-be or educators is mostly ad hoc. You might say, well, let's do more research. Well, the research in this space is very robust, but the problem is it's hidden behind academic jargon that even I can't read, paywalls, and is rarely translated in ways that teachers and educators and parents can understand. So this was a problem that I became obsessed with solving. So when I left Stanford with the support of UNICEF, I founded an organization called TILI. And what we do is something very simple. We bring together prolific researchers in this space with phenomenal designers to see how we can use three things. Data about the way children learn, the power of behavioral sciences, and play to see how we can build these foundational skills in children, and we target eight. Um, Tilly is now three years old, and we had a full circle moment because we've had now two Albright interns, one who's in the audience today, a shout out to Zora, um, who has helped us tremendously with this work over the summer. Um, and now you might ask me, well, how does this work? Can you show us how does this work? How does this get into the hands of children? Let me take you back two years into the May of 2021. Uh, my home country of Sri Lanka experienced one of the worst humanitarian crises of our time. Spiking inflation, a political crisis where we ousted a president, uh, malnourishment, and around 68% of families lost most or all of their income. And the worst hit, as with any crisis, were children. Mental health outcomes were terrible. Malnourishment meant that children weren't able to go to school anymore. Um, and among many other issues, there was a need for an effort to take children out of this crisis. Um, this is when our partners at UNICEF and Save the Children, two of the largest INGOs in the country, came together for a humanitarian response. So they were focusing on nutrition and food assistance. And we were brought into the picture and given the question of how can we provide psychosocial support to children so that we can help them deal with this toxic stress situation that they're in. So what we did was we brought together who we know, researchers and designers, and gave them this question, how might we translate this incredible research we know about how children learn and how children build skills to become very fun, playful, affordable experiences? And this is what we designed. A beautiful, if, I'm, if I say so myself, um, a learning kit accompanied by a digital tool that went into the hands of almost 4,000 children at the time and now 8,000. And this included two modules. The first was called Feelings and Emotions. And the focus there was building these two skills of self-awareness and management so that we were giving children the vocabulary to talk about what they were feeling and then also practical strategies to manage some of those big feelings. The second was about uh, bodies and boundaries. These were fun games and conversations that parents were having with children as they were talking about topics like body safety, consent, and boundaries. And this was a direct response to some of the increasing rates of domestic violence we were noticing in the midst of this crisis. So what did we learn? Development interventions are such that there is this problem called the last mile problem, which means that the research is great, the policy looks good on paper, but when that policy gets translated into solutions that get into the hands of communities, there is a last mile issue. Often the design is poor. So here's four things we learned. First, 
Many times we design solutions without understanding the environments in which these solutions will be enacted in. For us, we call this a learning environment. So our kids were used in environments like the one you see behind me. This is a child care center in Sri Lanka, where the activities are facilitated by a child protection officer. These are drop-in centers, which means that today you will get 10 children, tomorrow you might get 40. Then we have the same activity now being enacted in a family setting where a father gets a kit alongside his food packet and he needs to facilitate the session. Or it could happen in a classroom. Some of these classrooms have no electricity, some of them have a projector, some of them have 10 kits, some of them have 40. So how do we design solutions that could contract and expand based on the environment? Second, how do we design with and for communities and culture? We soon realized that similar to the research in this space, a lot of the content, the activities and curriculum were designed in North America and Europe for North American kids using English as a frame of reference. So we had to go back to the drawing board, drawing from our stories, our vernacular, our signs, to design something that used our culture and our community as a frame of reference. Thirdly, the concept of a low flow, high ceiling. This is something that doesn't only apply to learning, but any solution we design. This concept was familiarized by uh, Seymour Papert at the MIT Media Lab, and um, the concept is very simple. It says that any solution needs to have a very low flow to start. So for us, the low flow was when the kit was given to a classroom, the teachers would get the children to sit in a circle and read a story. That's it. But the ceiling has to be high, which means that when children build these skills, when teachers become familiar, they're able to make these environments their own and tools their own. Finally, as with life, all tools are constant prototypes. It's never perfect. Our learners are changing. The content environments, tools they're using are changing. So should the solutions, so should the learning tools. Finally, uh, recently our partners released an efficacy study to understand, well, we used Tilly, what did Tilly do? The research found out that four out of five parents who used Tilly were able to better manage and articulate their own emotions. So it's not just children this is impacting, but we're also training parents in an indirect way. And with children, nine out of 10 children were able to manage their anger better and develop better coping mechanisms. I want to end this presentation with a call to action to you as we're in the midst of one of the worst humanitarian crises that has affected our children in modern history. Almost 70 plus children in Israel have been killed or abducted. 10,000 Palestinian children have been killed in the past 100 days. My ask from you is what will your act of justice be? Thank you. We've covered snail hunting, star stuff, socio-emotional socio learning. Um, I can't wait for the next round. We're going to take a five-minute break. Please be back here at 3.10 to begin. Thanks. Hello, everyone. What do you think the next wave of feminism will look like? I believe that in our digital age, it will certainly be shaped, if not enabled, by AI. In recent years, artificial intelligence, or AI, has been used to improve processes in almost all major industries, including healthcare, finance, education, and in my previous job at an automotive company, we were implementing autonomous driving capabilities powered by AI. AI has transcended its role as simply a facilitator of tasks. Its next frontier is as a collaborator in redefining social norms. We knowingly or unknowingly interact with AI every day. It powers the algorithms behind our favorite websites, including the biggest retailers and the most addictive social media apps. When we search or scroll online, AI algorithms curate and filter the information we see. These algorithms are designed to learn about our habits which enables them to predict and present content that aligns with our interests or provokes an emotional response. Thus, the invisible hand of AI not only shapes our online experiences, 
but also subtly influences our opinions, preferences, and even social discourse in real life. Now, that can sound very scary if the content that the AI was exposing us to was riddled with bias and discriminatory messaging. And in our current iteration of AI, that is a risk. One of the current shortcomings of AI is that the quality of its outputs are dependent on the quality of the data sets that it pulls from. If those data sets include sexist, racist, and otherwise prejudiced data, the outputs of the algorithm will reflect those as well. But what if AI could be programmed to regulate itself out of those pitfalls? Luckily for us, it can be. AI can be programmed to identify biases as well as correct them, and it can be used to recognize inequalities in our institutions, propose equitable policies, and amplify voices that have been historically marginalized. So far, that hasn't been a priority for most AI developers, but for those of us who are interested in shaping and contributing to a more inclusive and egalitarian world, this is a huge opportunity. So how might we leverage this technology to further gender equity? It starts with embedding feminist principles at the very heart of AI development. This means creating algorithms that are inclusive, transparent, and accountable, that are developed using diverse global data sets to ensure that they generate outputs that represent the full spectrum of human experience and not just that of a narrow segment. Such feminist AI systems can be applied across multiple industries. Let's talk about three practical examples. Firstly, a feminist AI could revolutionize healthcare. Historically, medical research has been predominantly focused on male physiology, which has left health issues affecting women, trans people, and people of all genders under-researched. AI has the power to change this. For example, by analyzing patterns in women's health data, AI can lead to more accurate diagnoses and treatments specifically tailored to women's unique health needs in different demographics across the world. In the professional sphere, AI can also be a game changer. It can assist in removing biases from job descriptions to enable fair and diverse recruitment processes. We can also create AI tools that analyze pay scales, promotion histories, and performance evaluations to identify gender-based disparities. These insights can help organizations create more equitable workplaces based on concrete data. A feminist AI could transform the finance industry, where there are also significant gender biases, for example, in investing and lending. A feminist AI could help in developing financial products tailored to the unique needs of women, acknowledging differences in life expectancy, career patterns, and risk preferences compared to men. AI would not only be able to provide insight on the existing states of these industries, but to provide recommendations on how to proactively address these issues to eliminate bias in the future. A feminist-driven approach to AI would actively focus on constructing digital technologies that embody the values that we aspire to see in the real world. And because of its global reach, AI has the power to create widespread social change. What if the next version of ChatGPT only pulled from sources that had a diverse representation of genders, ages, and ethnicities, or at least alerted you when it didn't? What if you could download a browser extension that could help to identify bias in the articles you were reading or the media you were watching, like an automated Bechdel-Wallis test? AI is not only useful for analyzing the present, it can simulate diverse possibilities, which allows us to explore multiple what-if scenarios. In my work as a consultant, we have increasingly begun to rely on AI assistance to help us with research, trend analysis, forecasting, and strategic planning. We use sophisticated algorithms to explore potential futures based on different inputs and assumptions, which gives us insight to plan and prepare for a variety of outcomes. So why don't we also use AI assistance to model how different scenarios might affect women and other gender minorities. For example, we could simulate scenarios such as 
what are the implications of increasing the number of women in political office? Or how might we implement a global universal basic income? Or even what would Bell Hooks have thought about the Barbie movie? We now have access to low cost, almost instantaneous modeling technology that allows us to explore these ideas in a virtual sandbox. If the results don't make sense, we can change a variable and see how that affects the outcome. We can now use AI as a sophisticated thought partner to hash out ideas with. One of the questions that I recently posed to an AI chatbot was, what would a feminist utopia look like? This is the kind of question that my Wellesley friends and I have spent countless conversations imagining together. And while the results of the AI assistant do not have the depth and nuance of our discussions, they provide interesting starting points to build from. I don't take all of the content that AI generates as infallible, just as I would not take information from any other single source as infallible. What I do enjoy is asking complicated and weird questions that I get the beginnings of an answer to. I enjoy asking follow-ups. I enjoy being exposed to new worlds of ideas based on a prompt that I have entered. AI can be a catalyst for social change and can inspire upcoming generations of innovators, philosophers, artists, and activists. I believe that its strength is not in mimicking human intelligence, but in amplifying our creativity, knowledge, and empathy. A feminist AI would be a collaborator in shaping the ongoing conversation about gender equality. It would continuously learn and adapt, shaped by an ever-evolving understanding of what equality means. It wouldn't just reflect the world as it is, but as it could be, helping to envision and build a more equitable society. By integrating AI into our feminist toolkit, we can harness its power to analyze, educate, and advocate, and accelerate the journey towards gender equality and empowering groups that have been historically underrepresented. I would encourage you all to think about ways that AI can help to make your studies, research, and work more feminist. In conclusion, embracing feminist principles in AI is not just a matter of equity. It's a strategic investment in the creation of technologies that benefit everyone. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Lorna Lee and I'm a 2022 alum and a 2021 fellow. I'm the oldest of three sisters, the daughter of Chinese and Vietnamese immigrants and the granddaughter of two rocket scientists, a ship captain and a matriarch. It's those roles that help me lead solutions at Visual DX that fall into three strategic buckets, public health, global health and pharmaceutical slash cosmeceutical. As global citizens, we think about our health and how it affects our ability to live, play, and work. Today, I'll be talking about the health equity, equity work I do at Visual DX and how understanding the intersection of technology and medicine will make you all better consumers of healthcare and advocates of health equity. So when you think of a dermatologist, you might think of this scene from Grey's Anatomy where George, Christina, Meredith, and Izzy are really observing the aesthetic side of dermatology, where the focus seems to be on non-life-threatening conditions. And they're just obsessed over the fact that derms just love lotion, like they're just obsessed with lotion. And so this dramatized and reductionist view of derm often underscores the essential role that dermatologists play um, in global health. And so while derms love lotion, and they, but they, and they are skincare experts, they also identify and manage chronic and life-threatening conditions for patients that affect the skin, hair, and nails. Without dermatologists, patients suffer worse quality of life, or even worse, experience shorter life expectancy. Now that we've established how dermatologists play an essential role in the healthcare system, I want to bring your attention to an issue in the clinical industry that our team is working on a scalable solution for. That issue is physician shortage. In the United States, there's around 332 million people who live here. There are only 12,000 dermatologists who practice in the US. And so if we do the math on that in a perfect world, that means there's one dermatologist for every 27,000 people. 
Now, the United States and Ethiopia have their fair share of differences, but physician shortage is a common theme. There's 120 million people who live in Ethiopia. There's le fewer than 200 dermatologists who practice there. And so doing that math, that means there's one dermatologist for every 635,000 people. So this lack of access to dermatologists is a result of health inequities enforced by medical racism in the way that the world was set up. We all know that dermatologists in the United States and Ethiopia are equally scattered among all those thousands of people. They cent they're centered and practice in concentrated areas of wealth, and they typically don't accept Medicaid or other federal insurances. It really is a marker of social class if you're able to be seen by a dermatologist. So what does this mean for everyone who can't see one and has a skin issue? means that most skin conditions are seen in vulnerable populations by non-derms or emergency or primary care clinicians. And primary and emergency care clinicians only get one week of dermatology training in medical school. And for trained dermatologists, they've historically learned to recognize disease on the classic or white skin. And so this means that people with darker skin face a delay to diagnosis or misdiagnosis when compared to their white counterparts. So now when disenfranchised people or vulnerable communities experience a serious skin condition, they face this inability to access those skin experts. The patient might not have access to the internet to look for solutions, they might not have the language to know what to look up, or they might get healthcare at a free clinic that's far away and they have to take off work and it's really inconvenient. So this places this insurmountable barrier between the patient and the equitable care they deserve. At VisualDX, we ask ourselves this question. What if we could digitize years of clinical experience that ensured underserved populations received high quality care? And so with the modernization of technology and AI, there are a fleet of solutions available to address both physician shortage and health equity needs. So with the innovation of AI and health technology, developers have to be extremely careful not to reinforce human biases in the software. Before I mention how clinicians are historically trained to the classic or white skin, the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology published a cross-sectional analysis where researchers wanted to know which resource had the highest percent of images in dark skin. It was found that the company I worked for had nearly one-third of images in dark skin which was noticeably higher than printed text that many clinicians were trained on. This is important for the AI feature I'm gonna show you next. So we have a tool called Derm Expert, an AI model that we've trained on hundreds of thousands of images. And so in the Journal of Investigative Dermatology, it was found that our model performed at the same accuracy in both light and dark skin, which is important because of the collection that we had. Um, I'm gonna show you an example for an emergency department in Maryland, and I wanna give warning to anyone, if you don't wanna see medical images, there will be some in this example. So, um, patient came into the emergency department, resident had no idea what it was, it was a large lesion on the finger. Resident goes and grabs his attending, the attending has no idea what it is. He says, we have this new app, let's try it out and see what happens. So. Attending is sitting with the phone, taking a picture of the patient, resident on one shoulder, patient over the other, and he's running through what would be a dermatology consult, except it's the middle of the night in the emergency department, there's no derm available. So, took a picture of the patient, the doctor's asked to select a lesion type, and he's asking the patient these questions that a derm would want to know. And so it's almost doing this derm intake, it's asking where on the body it's located, some other bioinformatics questions like does it itch? When did this happen? Is the patient really sick? Because these are all things that will compile with the image to give um, what's called a differential diagnosis or a set of possible conditions. And so this ended up being a lobular capillary hemangioma. They're flipping through the photos. Patient goes, oh, doc, stop right there. That's what my finger looked like before I took some floss and cinched it off and then it started to grow very rapidly. So the doctor is collecting more information from the patient just by showing images. And there's no derm in the room, there's no derm on the phone. And so this is an example of technology bridging that doctor to doctor interaction when there are time, financial, and logistical constraints. So it's all great that we have this technology that can improve patient care, but tech delivery is all about your partners and your strategy. In partnership with the Gates Foundation, 
We are working to expand our AI model to include neglected tropical diseases, or NTDs. And so NTDs have been left behind by the Western world. They're completely eradicated in places like the US and Europe. But they deeply affect a person's quality of life, and we're working with partners in both Nigeria and India to empower their frontline healthcare workers with a clinically useful tool that's also simple to use. In partnership with the International Alliance for Global Dermatology, or GLODERM, we're rolling out visual DX to dermatologists all over the world. And so these derms are some of the few for hundreds of thousands of people. And they need help educating the rest of their clinical community. So by providing access to visual DX, they can ed educate masses of clinicians on a really scalable level. And finally, in the United States, we're working with the National Association of Free and Charitable Clinics. And so these clinics provide healthcare to people, whether they have insurance, whether they're housed, whether they can pay for their care. And so by providing Visual DX to these clinicians, they can bring this expert level information to patients who may never be able to see a dermatologist. I'll leave you with two final thoughts that I learned from the Albright Institute that are central to my work now. Take the job that aligns with your personal values. You're all qualified for so many jobs, but choose the one that makes the world a better place. And lastly, no problem is too big to tackle if you're the right partners in the room. For mission-driven work like global health, the community and um, the patient are represented by your partners, which are the most important stakeholder. And Secretary Albright taught us that no global solution is implemented by one company, one country, or one organization. And I really appreciate the partners in this room. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ifi, and this is my Madi talk. All right. Please raise your hand if you know your genotype for adult hemoglobin. All right. Please raise your hand if you know someone suffering from sickle cell anemia. Oh, some hands. OK, good. Please raise your hand if you have ever considered the hemoglobin genotype as a criteria when selecting a romantic partner. Yes, one hand. All right, all right, let's go. In 2017, before I moved to the United States to study at Wellesley, my friend who was a medical doctor in Lagos told me that it was the duty of people like me, those who were not carriers of the sickle cell mutation, to get married to people like him, those who carried the sickle cell trait. My friend, Dr. Francis, was bitter because he had to end multiple romantic involvements because his partners had the sickle cell, also carried the sickle cell mutation. I believe that given this talk, regardless of who I eventually marry, qualifies as using my non-carrier privilege for something good. Today, I'll be talking about global access to medicines in the era of gene therapies with a focus on sickle cell anemia. My goal is that this talk will have you thinking and working to make sure that when genetic medicines become commonplace, no patient is left behind, irrespective of where they are on the globe. Currently, about 8 million people around the world suffer from sickle cell anemia. Of this population, about 100,000 live in the United States. Meanwhile, 90% of the patient population is spread between Africa, India, and the Middle East. Sickle cell anemia is an autosomal recessive disease, meaning that you need two copies of the mutated gene, one from each parent to express the disease. If you have just one copy with the mutation, you're a carrier, like my friend Dr. Francis, and you won't experience any of the complications sickle cell anemia patients face. On the other hand, if you have no copies of the mutation, you're like me, a non-carrier. Thus, sickle cell anemia is a beautiful example of a disease where information is power. Genetic counseling and knowledge of one's hemoglobin genotype are tools that can help prevent the manifestation of sickle cell disease in a family. So I'm encouraging everyone today to go home and get tested. Know your genotype for hemoglobin. The most debilitating symptom associated with sickle cell disease is the pain crisis that results from vaso-occlusive events. 
Here, the sickled red blood cells in the blood vessels of patients attach to the walls and prevent the normal flow of blood. This prevents blood and oxygen from reaching tissues in the body, and if left untreated, can cause organ failure and death. This experience is excruciatingly painful. That's why it's called a crisis. All right. So one of the treatments that has helped so far is hydroxyurea. The two most important things hydroxyurea does are one, it reduces that adhesion of the sickled red blood cells to the blood vessel walls. And second, it increases the production of fetal hemoglobin, which cannot be sickled, unlike adult hemoglobin. In the United States, this treatment was approved for use by the FDA in 1998. However, this treatment is not readily accessible to people who desperately need it in Sub-Saharan Africa. And as a result, an estimated 50 to 90% of children born with sickle cell anemia in Sub-Saharan Africa die before reaching age five. All right, that's, that's depressing enough. There is hope. In 2014, a patient advocacy group in Ghana, the Sickle Cell Foundation of Ghana, partnered with Novartis, a pharmaceutical company, to improve access to hydroxyurea in Ghana. After multiple trials demonstrating the safety and clinical benefit of hydroxyurea in sickle cell anemia patients, Novartis registered this drug for sickle cell disease in 2018 in Ghana. Shortly thereafter, this alliance of patients and pharma, along with the government of Ghana, designed a holistic program to aggressively expand access to hydroxyurea in Ghana. To do this, they started by educating the patients and caregivers about the benefits of hydroxyurea. Next, they mobilized an app to remind patients of their appointments and when to take the medicines, and they also worked together with other manufacturers of this drug to try to lower the cost to patients. Almost nine years after the initial partnership between Novartis and the Sickle Cell Foundation of Ghana, in 2022, this drug became covered by the National Health Insurance Scheme in Ghana. Based on the success of this program, Novartis is currently working to increase access to hydroxyurea in other sub-Saharan African countries. To me, this program demonstrates that when there is a conscious effort to improve access, and this effort involves all stakeholders, patients, drug companies, government agencies, it can be done. So even though it took us more than 20 years to go from approval in the United States to expanded access in one of the regions that bears 90% of the disease burden, this program gives me hope that if we focus on access to genetic medicines now, we can shorten the time it takes to implement these therapies in Sub-Saharan Africa and therefore reduce the death and the pain faced by patients of sickle cell anemia. Okay. So one of the shining technologies that will usher in the future of genetic medicines is CRISPR. CRISPR is a technology that allows you to use a guide to direct a nuclease to cut a particular location in the DNA double helix. The cells then utilize DNA damage repair pathways to rejoin that cut, and in doing so, it adds or deletes random nucleotides in the DNA sequence. This causes a bunch of, pro a bunch of problems when the cell goes to make a protein from that gene, essentially allowing you to knock out any gene in the cell that you want. The possibilities are seemingly endless with this technology. Think of any disease, ALS, cancer, muscular dystrophy. You can probably use CRISPR to cure it. And I sincerely believe that this technology is the future of medicine. And so when I think about what the future of what the world will look like when genetic medicines are commonplace, I am scared and I'm filled with despair because I think about how many patients in different regions of the world will be left behind. One such medicine that has already been approved is the Casjevi, made by Vertex, which is a Boston-based pharmaceutical company. This medicine is an ex vivo gene therapy, which means that patient cells are collected and then taken to a lab where they're edited. And then the edited cells are put back in the patients. In Casjevi, the BCL11A gene that signals for the creation of adult hemoglobin instead of fetal hemoglobin is edited out using CRISPR. This ensures that the red blood cells produced in the body of patients post this therapy will be fetal and thus will alleviate some of the symptoms that they experience. 
You can imagine the logistical and financial burden it would take to administer such a bespoke medicine. This is why this therapy is currently priced to cost patients $2.2 million. This price makes this medicine out of reach for most patients across the globe, not just in Sub-Saharan Africa. Imagine saying to someone, I have a cure for debilitating pain, you just can't afford it. That's the world we live in right now. And if we do nothing, we're on track to take longer than 20 years before genetic medicines can be introduced in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yet, we need not fall into despair. In Ghana, the Sickle Cell Foundation worked with Novartis and the government to make access to hydroxyurea possible and expanded. We can do the same with genetic medicines. It'll involve way more work. It'll involve lots of infrastructure, but it can be done. We just have to want to make it happen. When I think about the future, as someone who has always wanted to make drugs and is lucky enough to currently be working in the field of gene editing, I want to know that the work I contributed to today can reach everyone across the globe and not just be reserved for those who can afford it. So in conclusion, I leave you with two action items. Please know and find out your hemoglobin genotype and encourage everyone you know to get tested too. And also think about considering it when you're picking your romantic partners. Second, keep this conversation going. Talk to your friends, your children, your relatives, your coworkers, and make sure everyone is talking about access to genetic medicines in Sub-Saharan Africa so that one day I can call Dr. Francis and tell him to marry whoever he wants. Thank you. Hi everyone, good to be here, here at Wellesley. Um, walking around here always helps me do a little bit of time travel. So I was here in the early 2010s. A lot of us were using this thing called First Class, it was like this online forum thing where staff, students, and professors could all talk to each other. Um, at the same time, there was an uprising of general social media happening in that period. So LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. In fact, I only signed up for LinkedIn because the Albright Institute forced me to do it in order to join. And for the first 10 years of LinkedIn, my password was all right. So uh, most of the time, these social media platforms get a pretty terrible rep reputation about being like a general cesspool for all of our most awful behavior. Um, and for a long time, I also believed in this narrative. So after I graduated, I moved to Tanzania. I was actually kind of grateful that um, internet was kind of weak there. And you had to pay per megabyte. So yeah, uh, nothing like the free market to help me control my desires. Um, um, so I was offline more than most people. Then when the pandemic hit, I was actually caught in Australia at the time. I didn't have a job, I didn't really know that many people, I didn't know how to build a community um, because we had shelter in place. So I thought, oh, maybe it's time to sign back online. So I did. And what I found was actually uh, exceeded all expectations. Um, what I realized is there's actually so many corners of the internet right now that are more similar to like, like what we experienced on first class, whether it was how we banded together against JFAM or stuff that we would see on Wellesley's administrare, um, you know, stories of helping grandmothers in airports navigate security. I don't know if you heard about that one, but you should look it up. <laughs> very, very cool. And so this made me wonder if my experience is like this, like why are we still reading these kind of headlines? Where is the disconnect here? And it made me realize the internet is really what we make it to be. We've created it. Um, it's the set of communities, and especially with so much transitioning online because of COVID-19, I wonder, I wonder if we try to frame the internet and we learn from it to try to build um, a more trusting, generous, interconnected, pluralistic, and kind world, like would that be possible? Because that's certainly the world that I'd like to live in. So how does this start? What are some things I've learned from my internet explorations? I wanna share three of them with you today. Um, one of the first one is around brave spaces um, and finding a balance between safe and brave spaces. Um, now I know for myself, I need safe spaces. I need a place where I can vent and people just validate my experiences and it's mo a lot of people who are like me and um, especially when I've been in that danger zone where I feel very alone and attacked. But at the same time, I've realized if I stay too long in these safe spaces, I, I 
don't really have a full awareness of myself, um, and I'm limiting my self-discovery if I stay in this, safe, in this comfort zone. So I've started seeking out these different brave spaces where I can trust people care about my well-being and that they will challenge me with different perspectives. Um, I've, uh, one example of a brave space was actually a couple days ago, I'm working with a coach and we're talking about trust and my, um, some challenges with trust and he asked me, what are the check boxes that you have in order to trust somebody? And I was a little bit caught off guard and he mentioned, yeah, a lot of his clients actually don't have an answer to that. And what that usually means is people either trust too easily or they, trust, they don't trust anybody. And neither of that is healthy. We don't know how to actually build trust. So this was a pretty confronting conversation, not very easy, uh, but it revealed a blind spot to myself, which I thought was meaningful. So that, that's a brave space, right? Um, second, so that's brave space's the second thing, is belonging. So what, what is belonging? Um, I'm actually inspired by a definition that my friend Michelle told me around belonging equals fit plus role. A lot of people might think of belonging more as being able to fit in, be like everyone else, right? Um, but I think this role piece is uh, quite critical. Um, and when I talk about fit, so fit means to me my ability to see myself in you and my ability to feel seen by you. And when I talk about role, it's my ability to contribute my unique gift to co-create our community together, right? Um, and what we see nowadays in, our, in the US, which is where I'm focused now, um, is that a lot of people are working jobs um, they don't necessarily like for pay that they don't necessarily feel is enough um, in relationships they might not be the happiest with for whatever reason. And they're not totally sure what their role is in the society. So I think that's what's leading to us kind of over-indexing on fit because I believe, and a lot of scientists back up this up, is that um, belonging is like a human need that's just the same as food and water and shelter. And if we don't, if we can't find it, we will do anything to, we will do anything to achieve it, right? So if we can't find it through role, we're going to over-index on fit, we're gonna look for people who are more similar to ourselves because it's easier to find that fit and I, I don't know, this sort of to me feels like, is it any surprise that we have so much polarization and siloing in this country right now? Um, so I wonder, the third thing that I want to mention is around participation. Um, this is where I'm gonna bring back a framework that I used to use in my five-ish years in Tanzania um, around participatory design. So we used to talk about design for, design by, design with. I could go into lots of detail about this, but in short, design for is usually when a group of designers designs for a group that's experiencing a problem. Design by is when the group experiencing a problem solves the problem themselves. And design with is a bit of a combination of the two. Um, now, what people normally might jump to is like, oh, we all want design by, and yes, I love design by, design with, some of the pictures on the, on the left here, um, whether it's a farmer making a avocado oil press, or whether it's a group of secondary school kids making a bicycle powered washing machine, super cool. Um, but at the same time, uh, like I, I took a plane here, and to be honest, I'm, I'm totally fine if it's a bunch of engineers in the back room making that plane as safe as possible for me to be in. And I don't need to participate in, as, in the same way as with some of these other kinds of initiatives, right? So there's a place and there's a time and a space for everything. Um, and so we've got these three kind of concepts, right? Brave spaces, belonging, and participation. And I think they can all learn from each other. Another thing I learned in Tanzania is that the best examples of participatory design were when all the stakeholders were created a brave space for themselves and felt a deep sense of belonging based on their long-term commitment to a community, a place that they called home together. Um, so now my work is all about how do we actually create this sense of home, um, looking at it across these three pillars of society around social, political, and economic. Um, now, I really think it's important to look at all three of these pillars because a lot of us feel like, again, we can't contribute to it, we don't have a role in how these are shaped, but we do because we are 
we are actually the ones making these systems ourselves, right? Um, so a lot of critics, um, especially more globally minded ones, might be like, great, belonging, participation, um, fair spaces, that all sounds nice at the local level, but you know, how do we, how do we scale this? Uh, so I wanna give one example that I think is really interesting, uh, especially in light of the elections last weekend in Taiwan. Um, so in Taiwan, the, like one big struggle for any community is how to deal with disruption. And so one disruption is technology. So in 2015, Uber came to Taiwan and wanted to enter the market. Normally what happens is the government makes some decisions and people, people are bad and da 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 da. In Taiwan, what they did is they opened up the process to the broader community. They invited people to use a machine learning software called Polis, and they had a, niche, or a, 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 wide, um, a wide campaign around mass media um, to share different concepts around the concept. And then what they what what happened is they had over or they had almost 5,000 people actually contribute their different ideas and not only contribute their ideas but build on each other's ideas because that's one of the things that can get lost in a lot of these participatory processes is people kind of feeling a bit siloed within them. So they used a little, it's a little bit of gamification, a little bit of ma like mass media, and happy to talk about it more um, to come to conclusions that led to the government passing legislation that was actually really easy to pass because it had all the inputs from the uh, community already. So getting something to happen like this requires a really committed strategy around sharing power. This is not um, what the inertia of mainstream society leads us to do and requires a ton of commitment, hope, and inspiration because it's really messy actually to get into the relational elements of what makes our communities. Um, so inspired by examples like Taiwan, um, I was actually like so inspired that I returned to the US to work on a startup that I'm founding called Common Agency, where we look at three, the three pillars of society to try to design ways to bring communities together, especially, specifically neighborhoods, US neighborhoods, um, around belonging and trust. And again, happy to go more into detail with that when I have more time. So anyway, I just wanna close with this question for you, which is how can you and all of us incorporate more belonging, participation, and brave spaces in da -da 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 -da, whatever communities you're part of? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ryan, a fellow in the Albright cohort of 2023, and I'm very excited to be talking with you today about nuclear narratives and digital media. With the proliferation of social applications, whether that's TikTok or Instagram, we are exposed to countless trends as they rise and fall in any given year. But I'd like to draw attention to one particular trend that caught the world by surprise in 2023. That would be Barbenheimer. <laughs> now, this is the joint name of two blockbuster films that absolutely catapulted discussion of nuclear weapons to the world stage once again. And if we can look past the glaring differences between these two, in which there are many, many differences, we have Barbie with the glamour and the bright colors, and then Oppenheimer, which is a much more somber film about a physicist at the dawn of the age of nuclear weapons. If we look past these, we can actually see that they're quite connected. I've been looking into these connections through my work at the intersection of the socio-techno web and nuclear weapons, which is something I'd like to delve into a little deeper in this presentation. And just for a roadmap, I'll be discussing, one, how I found this interest in using digital tools to get people informed on and engaged in the nuclear discussion. Two, why that engagement is so important. And three, some ongoing work in the field, particularly that happened this fall at a United Nations conference I had the privilege of attending, thanks in large part to my Albright internship experience that I had the previous summer. Now, how did my path start? With this book. This is The Spread of Nuclear Weapons, a debate renewed by Sagan and Waltz. And this book came to me in 2021 in the miraculous form of the Wellesley Sustainability Bin. 
And this book was eye-opening for me because I was able to view the implications of nuclear weapons in a context that was unfamiliar to me. And that was an academic context. Because of course, I had learned about nuclear weapons, however briefly, in a history class, perhaps in high school, and perhaps earlier. But that was a part of my dilemma. There had been so much distance in time between myself and a critical examination of this topic. So when I was faced with the mountains of entertainment-focused media that involved nuclear weapons, it became harder and harder to separate the two. My exposure to um, atomic weapons was unfortunately limited to what I saw in games, what I saw in Hollywood movies. And that was not grounded in reality. And that reality is that nuclear weapons continue to affect the lived realities of millions of people around the globe to this day. The fact that I had lost sight of the world-altering capabilities of these weapons of mass destruction in anything but a fictionalized context was not something that sat right with me. But I didn't give up. Instead, it made me want to understand how nuclear weapons shaped popular culture and what I could do to further and make this niche, specialization-heavy field more accessible in the digital landscape. So why is it important to keep an ear to the ground when it comes to nuclear arms control? For starters, we're all affected by it. Whether we live in targeted cities or if we live in regions that have been affected or even polluted by the mining, the processing, or even the testing of radioactive materials that go into these weapons or the weapons themselves. It's clear that the nuclear story is intertwined with so many narratives that play out in our daily lives, as I've illustrated here. There's the environmental aspect, there's public health, there's the economic angle, and of course, as I'll repeatedly go back to, there's that digital and that information sphere that we should also consider. Despite these considerations, many are under the impression, and admittedly, I once was as well, that we close the book on the nuclear story with the end of the Cold War and the vast reduction of nuclear arsenals. However, this is simply not the case. We continue to see the very real threat of nuclear escalation in many instances, including the Russia and Ukraine conflict, though this is one among many, and that's just in recent years. Each, each such instance, however, is reason enough to look into nonproliferation and disarmament efforts. The final subject that I'll touch on under this umbrella is once again that pervasiveness in popular culture. Social media has been indispensable in getting people access to nuclear histories, getting them inspired to learn more, because there is so much to learn. And for an example, we need not look farther than Barbenheimer, which shed light on topics like the Manhattan Project, which was integral to even the creation of these weapons in the first place, and brought it to an entirely new generation. Everyday people are engaged in the critical work of making nuclear topics accessible online from an academic standpoint rather than purely entertainment, though we can use entertainment mediums, as I've, uh, as I've demonstrated, to get that point across. And this leads me to my conclusion. The work of civil society, youth, and more at the second meeting of states' parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons at the United Nations in New York. So just for context, <laughs> this is me and some new friends that I made at a campaigners meeting for ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And the next photo is my dear Veronique uh, Christie, who is the senior advisor of arms control to the international campaign for the, um, the Red Cross. And we are at the permanent mission of Ireland to the United Nations. So I just uh, wanted to highlight that there. And thank you again for being here. Now, the 2MSP was a week-long conference 
that I was there in my capacity as communications coordinator for Reverse the Trend and the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, both of whom I was able to intern under and work for through my Albright internship. So the week was filled with over 60 side events in addition to the plenary meetings. And among those events were campaigner meetings, like the ones pictured. There were panels, films, art exhibits, performances, and even youth concerts, all of which demonstrate the multimedia approaches that are taken in getting people involved in the nuclear discussion. Some of these mediums have been old and tried and true, like films. But there are also a couple new ones that you might want to put on your radar. For example, I served as a panelist for a TikTok for Disarmament event. And it might sound silly to hear the terms of nuclear disarmament and TikTok in the same sentence. I thought so as well at first. But the event actually served as a great way for young people to discuss how they were using social media, the tools of the day, to get people talking on nuclear narratives. And another strong theme of the conference was on restoration efforts and victim assistance to those who have been grievously affected by nuclear weapons or their testing. This was spearheaded by Kazakhstan and Kiribati, two nations who did a joint resolution that was adopted just a month before the conference. So there was definitely a ton of buzz about it there. And there were so many more intriguing outcomes that would extend this talk by quite a bit. So I won't be able to cover them today, but instead I'll end with this. We are at the forefront of a media revolution that is changing the way that we think, talk, and learn about nuclear weapons. I invite you to examine the media that you consume on this topic. And if nuclear media isn't on your radar yet, that's OK because there's still plenty of time to learn, and it's only a scroll away. Thank you. All right, last one. Hang in there. We're all aware of Madeleine Albright's incredible professional achievements. US ambassador to the UN first female Secretary of State, champion of nonproliferation, humanitarian intervention, and women's rights, to name just a few. But for those of us in the first Albright Institute cohort, we were bestowed the incredible gift of learning from the trailblazer herself. In true Wellesley fashion, we had tea with Secretary Albright. We also had luncheons and roundtable discussions where she regaled us with tales from Camp David. It was through these interactions that I learned about the woman behind the headlines, the kind of woman and professional that I wanted to be. I'll never forget the day that our Albright Institute teams presented to respected scholars, peers, and to Madeleine Albright. In this very suit, by the way. <laughs> Each of our teams was assigned a Millennium Development Goal, or Sustainable Development Goals, as they're more recently known. And yes, I recognize that I just dated myself, but at least the suit still fits. <laughs> Thank you. So our team was assigned the MDG Eradicate Extreme Poverty and Hunger. That's right, as 20, 21-year-old college students, we were expected to present the solution to world poverty and hunger to Madeleine Albright herself, who, by the way, was seated in what could only be described as an oversized velvet throne. <laughs> Not at all intimidating. And I was. I was a bundle of nerves. But among those many gifts bestowed by the Institute was a moment of realization. I would kick myself forever if I did not go out there and give it my all. And so I did. Maddie lesson number one, I can do hard things. At the end of that infamous day, I approached Secretary Albright and gave her a lapel pin 
to add to her collection. In true dad fashion, my father had sent it to give as a little thank you token. Well, my parents live in Florida, and it was a giant bright pink flamingo. So I approached Secretary Albright and handed over the gaudy beast. She graciously thanked me, and I slinked off into the crowd. But about a week later, I opened my wealthy mailbox to find a handwritten thank you note from Madeline Albright. This icon of her time, a trailblazer, a glass ceiling destroyer, had taken the time to pen a handwritten thank you note to an uneasy wealthy student. Maddie lesson number two, being kind and formidable are not mutually exclusive. So now fast forward 10 years with me, if you will. I was over the moon to be attending the Albright Institute's 10 year reunion. And I had brought along my now husband and our dog. Can you guess her name? Madeline Albright, of course, or Maddie for short. And I came with an agenda. I sidled up to Secretary Albright's assistant and casually mentioned that my dog, Madeline Albright, just happened to be outside of Pendleton, <laughs> wearing a bright blue Wellesley t-shirt with a giant W emblazoned on the back. Wouldn't a meeting of the Albrights be a hoot? Amazingly, both she and Secretary Albright thought that this would indeed be a hoot. And when my boyfriend turned photographer went to take the photo, he tried to get the dog's attention, saying, Maddie, Maddie. Without skipping a beat, Secretary Albright looked at him and said, dead pan, which one? <laughs> to which he replied, both, I guess. And so there is a photo of me laughing alongside both human and canine, Madeline Albright, as you can see. <laughs> Maddie lesson number three, you can be a powerhouse woman and still have a sense of humor. I am amazed by how much I learned from this extraordinary woman in such a short period of time but her lessons continue to resonate in my daily life. For instance, when I had just started a new role supporting a global business model transformation, my peers were to a person, men with decades of experience on me, and I was perceived to be coming in and taking over their largest deals. It was brutal, but I didn't give up because I already knew that I could do hard things. Another time, when I was interviewing for a job, the interviewer said that while she felt I had the requisite skills for the role, she thought that I was too nice to make tough decisions. And I reminded her that being kind and being able to do challenging things are not mutually exclusive. And once, when I had just started at a new company, one of their largest clients threatened to cancel. And during a conversation with them, they used an analogy to prove their point. So in response, I built on it and added on a respectful joke. The whole tone of the room changed as everyone burst out laughing. It was a turning point in our conversation and in our relationship. Because you can take seriously yourself, your client, and the situation, and still, have a sense of humor. I feel so lucky to be part of this group and to have been inspired by such an incredible woman. But sometimes I can feel exhausted by what it takes to be a woman in business and in life. I feel like our predecessors, like Madeleine Albright, worked tirelessly to pave a path. And I can feel dismayed by our progress. If you look at the data, the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report found that in Q1 of 2023, the number of women in leadership roles receded to 32%. Less than 30% of the US Congress is represented by women. And we have never 
had a female president in this country. But we cannot give up. It is experiences like the Albright Institute and Wellesley that arm us with the skills we need and propel us forward. And it is on each of us to continue paving that path and lifting each other up in whatever setting we choose. And when we do, the world wins. And so I hope that each of us will take those lessons we learned from Secretary Albright and from each other and continue to build on her work as amazing Wellesley women who will make a difference in the world. Thank you all. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you again so much to our Maddie Talk speakers for your ideas, your passion, your incredible work in the world. Please join me in giving them another round of applause.